Often, when students review old final exams, they see questions relating to slipping. And slipping is one of those issues that we don't cover as much in the current version of MIE 100, as it is something that is more related to the statics course. We don't really have movement in this. And so it's helpful to sort of start by just going through this as, as maybe a, a refresher potentially, but if you haven't covered it, just to talk about it really quickly. So one of the big issues is often when we deal with problems in MIE 100, we're looking at slipping because we are interested in static equilibrium into say a case where you exceed it and you suddenly see the object move. And really it's an analysis of the normal force that's important here. And so the goal here is why would a mass slip or tip and what would happen to the normal force in that case? Again, if you review past midterms and finals, you're often asked about tipping. Uh, and then the question fairly comes out, which is why don't we do this? And, and one of the reasons is that we often uh, shift our textbooks and, and the idea is, is emphasized potentially in one text and not in another. And it was in the one text we used about 10, 15 years ago, and it, it is kind of a neat problem. But the main point out of this, this discussion is really to look at the normal forces. So uh, there's a person in the video and you can see them and they're uh, busy pushing along. And as they push, something's going to happen. Will the crate tip? Will it slip? What will happen? And this is really what makes slipping and tipping a, an interesting problem to deal with. So starting with the slip case, what we can do is we can look at this crate, just separate it out, and do the same sort of analysis you're used to at this point with a coordinate system defined here as x and y. I have all the forces acting on there. I have friction force, which is here. I've got the normal force, I've got the weight, and I've got the pushing force. And of course, this is from my previous uh, diagram on the, uh, on with, the, with the person pushing a crate. If the push is less than the maximum static force, the box doesn't move, so the force is in the x direction equals zero, and it's force of push minus force of friction equals zero. It goes up to a maximum value, so force of friction max is equal to the use of S in. So I can keep pushing and pushing, and I won't move until I reach that value. Once I reach that value, then I will switch to mu sub k n. So it's a step change. So force of, of the push is greater than force uh, uh, friction max, the box slips. In reality, what we're assuming for the normal force is a uniformly is actually uniformly distributed along that bottom surface. So it's not a point force like I've shown it in all three body diagrams, but it looks like that. The drawings that we use make sense because it's easier to just say, here's one big arrow to instead of writing 20 little arrows. So the normal force acts uniformly along the bottom and everything is great. So let's take a little bit more of a look at that friction force in the normal uh, and see what happens. So the same free body diagram as before, but in green are the two values I'm most interested in. And the reason is friction is directly related to that normal. So when I add everything together, I could sort of create a small triangle and say the friction force acts in to, the, to the left in this case, because I'm assuming a push to the right, and I have a normal force acting upward from the floor. I have a resultant force between the normal and the friction force that I can define. And that kind of gives me something that's a little bit new. That is, it's sort of, the, well, it's the resultant. It's the resultant between the two and it acts at an angle. And that angle is phi. So if I use this value of phi, I can say for a static case, tan phi sub s is equal to mu sub s, the maximum. And then under sort of movement cases, tan phi sub k equals mu sub k. Phi will reach a maximum at maximum mu, mu sub s and then decrease for mu sub k. So you, know, you, you can keep pushing and keep pushing. You don't necessarily reach any value. So this is just kind of useful to sort of define what's happening in here. What happens with tipping? So I have, again, 
Now I'm going to distribute that normal force along the bottom. I have no pushing at this point. I have weight acting downward. And I, I put a friction force. It's not really acting because there's nothing to uh, resist. But as I apply a pushing force, I start to cause a tip. And the tip is likely going to be along the bottom right corner. And as I keep pushing, this the normal is going to redistribute itself. So there'll be less normal force to the left and more to the right. And that distribution will continue until it reaches kind of this maximum. And if you look at the left diagram, I've sort of put a normal resultant in there. And you can see it lines up nicely with the weight force. And then as I increase the force of pushing and I'm not moving, I'm acting to cause a normal resultant. And then eventually it sort of moves off and away from the actual body. It's no longer attached because there's no way to, to keep it in value. Uh, and so the only thing really balancing out all of this stuff are the weight force and the pushing force. So you gotta be aware that as you push, the normal force will shift to the right. Pulling will result in the opposite shift. Okay, so if I were pulling, we, we don't do pulling problems because they're more fun. Right? I mean, they're the same thing, but they're in a negative sense. And it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, honestly. Um, normal weight moments will counter the moment from the push until they cannot. And so you, you kind of can put here, for example, a case where you don't have tipping. You have a normal force and a uh, resultant for a normal resultant, which is going to act a distance that's x2 here. And you have weight force, which is acting in the x direction. And each of those forces will cause counterclockwise uh, or clockwise moments. And so you, that's how you deal with it. If you add in the right corner, uh, or you move the, the normal force to the right corner, you end up with a pushing force and the weight force. The normal force is acting in the corner, or it's going to shift off, and it's not going to play a role. And when it can't do anything anymore, that will tip. And you can sort of intuitively see that now, I hope. So if force of the push is greater, if the moment caused by the pushing is greater than the weight, the box tips. All right, I have a, I'm, I'm a, a father, I have daughters who have to push heavy things around their dorms and things like that. This, and so let's sort of go with a case where a student moves a 45 kilo uh, crate to the left in their dorm by applying a force P at the corner P, B as shown. So you can see all the forces there. P is the one in green. You're given dimensions of 1.1 meter along the top surface and the vertical surface is 0.78 meters. You know when the crate starts to tip about the edge when that distance about E from edge E is about 210 millimeters, find the coefficient of kinetic uh, friction between the crate, static friction, and the, and, the, and the dock, and the corresponding magnitude peak. So if I look at this, I can start out by either putting the normal friction forces acting at point E, or go back to using at point E, the, the red arrow indicates the resultant of both of those forces, and that gives me a direction for those forces. As well, I have the weight, which is acting through the center of the box, even though it may not look like it. And I have the, the pushing force P. So as I sort of draw out a triangle, the resultant force is acting along the line EG. Uh, and the pushing force is acting along the line BG. And the weight is acting at the center, a distance IE from uh, point E. That angle is phi sub s, which we just defined earlier when we were talking about slip. And I can start to define distances. So I have gh, which is going to be ab divided by 2 uh, tan of 18 degrees of 0.179 meters. I have gi, which is equal to gh plus ih, so the vertical distance to g, and that's 0.9587 meters. So if I take all of that together, I can sort of calculate out uh, the tan phi sub s. And that tan phi sub s is just going to be EI over GI. And I'll get 19.52 degrees. And I'll get uh, from that using mu, or 
phi sub s. Mu sub s I'll get tan phi sub s, which is 0.36. So I know now what this coefficient of static pressure is. Now, if I draw a triangle, I have that triangle right there, and I can say that the angle is phi sub s, and I have all of the forces acting on it. And the different, or so it's phi sub s is 72 degrees, it's coming from the 18 degrees. Um, and then I have 88.47 degrees to fill out that triangle. So if I want to relate weight and uh, the pushing force P, then I have to make a force triangle. And that force triangle is going to be P over sine phi sub s and weight over 88.74 degrees. So uh, the somewhat horizontalish line is going to correspond to P. This, the vertical line will correspond to weight. So my only unknown here is weight. Everything else has to be in balance. Put everything together, and I end up with 147.671 newtons before tipping will occur. This is really just a, a quick discussion to look at slipping and tipping, and just to give you a definition. It's not as useful in our, in our course because we don't do very much with slipping or sorry, tipping, we do a lot with slip. Um, but it is useful when you're kind of analyzing static problems. And it's important when dealing with systems. So as engineers, you, you will sort of face problems where you have to be concerned not only with whether the object will slip, but whether it will tip. Thank you very much, and we'll talk later.